1 Corinthians. Last Sunday afternoon, we looked at the Corinthian church and admonitions from Paul to that church to examine some of the benefits and examples of goodness that lead to success in a local church. This week we're going to look at the other side of the spectrum from the church at Corinth and admonitions that Paul gave that church which hinder success. Last week we looked at things that were beneficial to success and this week we'll look at things that are hindrances to success of the local church. Now if you have studied the books of 1st and 2nd Corinthians you'll know that there are a lot of problems that were mentioned and dealt with. We don't have the time uh, this afternoon to go through all of them. So I've kind of chosen a few in 1 Corinthians to mention and to uh, categorize those. And perhaps when studying First and Second Corinthians, you'll see that other problems that they had may fit into one of these categories. Many of the problems that the church at Corinth had were due in part because the church was still young. The church had only been established some decades before. And there were individuals who had come out of Judaism. And there were individuals who had come out of heathenism. Corinth was in a very busy place on the map. Individuals traveling uh, for business or for pleasure or for whatever reason, many would find themselves at Corinth at some, por at some point in time because of the, the ease of access to travel and business there. And that brought in a lot of diversity. That brought in a lot of characters, if you will. It brought in good people, but it brought in some bad people. And so there were all types of personalities and all types of individuals. And of course, some of their problems were due in part to just normal everyday things that uh, individuals have to fight. Personality problems, problems uh, that each individual has on their own, individual faults that we have that would have crept into the church that wouldn't have been dealt with properly. So the faults were individual at some times, and those individuals, uh, uh, their disease spiritually spread to others. And of course, uh, there, were, uh, there were problems that were not individual, but corporate. No matter what the reason, there was no excuse, was there? And that is what uh, Paul gets to primarily. And that's why he addresses these issues. And it's important for us to look back at these hindrances because obviously as a local congregation, we don't want to be hindered from success. And anything that can hinder us from success, we need to make sure that we get rid of. Anything that is a problem, we need to make sure we fix it. We need to correct it. We need to turn hindrances into benefits, into progress. When we first look at uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 1, we find that the first thing that was a hindrance to success in the local church was Paul heard that there was divisions among them. In 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 10, Paul says, I beseech you, brethren, by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that you all speak the same thing and that there be no divisions among you, but that you be perfectly joined together in the same mind and in the same judgment, for it hath been declared unto me of you, my brethren, by them who are of the house of Chloe, that there are contentions among you. Now this I say, that every one of you saith, I am of Paul, and I have Apollos, and I have Cephas, and I have Christ. Is Christ divided? Was Paul crucified for you? Were you baptized in the name of Paul? I thank God that I baptized none of you but Crispus and Gaius, lest any should say that I had baptized in my own name. So first thing we come up with, cross here in the church at Corinth was there was a contentious attitude. There was a division because of that contentious attitude. 
And one of the examples given where individuals were setting themselves apart in the one body of Christ into cliques. Who had been baptized of Peter? Who, uh, who had Paul baptized? Who had Apollos baptized? We're not told why this developed. Why individuals felt the need to separate into cliques or groups based upon who had baptized them. It could have been based upon uh, pride. Maybe they thought my baptism is better than yours because the Apostle Peter did it. I don't know. We're not told the exact reason. It may have, been, it may have just been personalities that clashed and they just wanted a reason to fight. And they said, Here's a, we'll just bring this up. you know. But whatever the reason was, there was a contentious nature. There was a contentious attitude. And it caused division. And that's a hindrance to success. Paul said, Christ is not divided. Paul said, I preach the same gospel Peter preached. Peter preaches the same gospel Apollos preached. We're all united. We all speak the same thing. Verse 10, and we want you to do the same thing. Brethren, I beseech you by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ that you all speak the same thing and that there be no divisions among you. Now, important to note here is there's only one way to not have division in the church. And that's if we all speak the same thing. When people start speaking different things, there's going to be division. You can't help it. If people start teaching something that is contrary to the Gospel of Christ, there ought to be division. <laughs> it ought not be tolerated. And we'll get to that here in just a moment. Well, in chapter 3, uh, this may explain a little bit the mentality of why this division occurred. I don't know. It may have just been another example or aspect. But in chapter 3, Paul says, And I, brethren, could not speak unto you as unto spiritual, but as unto carnal, even as unto babes, unto Christ. Now, a lot of people get this carnal and spiritual thing and they make a whole big to-do about it. But basically, all he's saying here is, some of you are thinking fleshly as if you had not been baptized and you need to have grown spiritually and I can't speak to you as a spiritually mature individual because you've not grown <laughs> so uh, he says in verse 2 I have fed you with milk and not with meat here he's talking about the gospel of Christ but he's saying I started with small things and just like we would feed a baby you start with something that it can uh, digest and tolerate and then as the baby grows and matures and uh, the teeth grow and, and the digestive system gets stronger and more mature, you can feed it something uh, stronger. For hitherto you were, able to, you were not able to bear it, neither now are you able to bear it. In other words, he's saying, by now you should have been able to eat better, but you've not grown any. For ye are yet carnal. That is, you still think in a worldly way. For whereas there is among you envying and strife and division, uh, divisions, are you not carnal and walk as men? So maybe part of the reason there was division is they had not grown spiritually. <laughs> well, not growing spiritually is a hindrance to success in a local church. Can you imagine <laughs> if a whole congregation was made up of babes in Christ? You know, it's a wonderful thing to have such a diverse age group you know young people older people individuals who have been there done that new people new christians uh, the new christians can learn from the more mature christians the older christians and the older christians can share their experience and knowledge and wisdom with others and uh, and and older christians can be encouraged and edified by seeing the younger christians grow and work and mature as Paul would tell the church at Corinth, we are many members but one body, right? We're perfectly joined together to, to, to be a well-oiled machine, in other words. These divisions, the envy, the strife, he said you're thinking worldly. We don't need worldly thinking in the church. All of the problems really that occur in the church are based on people bringing into the church something God didn't. God knew how, what He wanted the church to do. He knew how He wanted it to, do, to be done. He told us how to do it. And then man comes along and says, God didn't do it right. Why aren't we keeping our children? Well, let's give them some games to play. right? 
or uh, why aren't, that we ought to be asking, why aren't we keeping our adults? <laughs> you know, there are as many adults falling away as there are children who... Uh, and there, it, it all comes back to maturity. They're not spiritually mature. They need more meat. We need to grow. So here we see a hindrance to the church is spiritual immaturity in, a, in addition to worldly thinking. Allowing worldliness to creep into the church. Those are things that hinder success to a local church. In chapter 11, the divisions were so great that they couldn't even have a fellowship meal without dividing up into their cliques, it seems. And Paul says here in 1 Corinthians 11, how can you all eat together in a common meal, a fellowship meal, and act like you're one body, you know, many members, one body, but you divide up. And then during the worship service, you sit together and you have a communion like you're all one. How can you do that, you know? How can you act like you're unified and you're communing with Christ at one point in time, then when you get out of the worship service and you go eat, you all divide up like you don't know each other. Verse 20 of chapter 11, he says, When you come together, therefore, into one place, this is not to eat the Lord's Supper. He's talking here about a, a common fellowship meal, not the worship service. For in eating, everyone taketh before his own supper, and one is hungry and another is drunken. You don't even care if your brother has something to eat. All you care about is your little group. You and your little group, right? And so here we have spiritual immaturity and division. And he compares that to or he makes, not comparison, but he uses the Lord's Supper to say, how can you during the worship service say you're one with Christ and you're brothers and sisters in Christ and you partake of the bread and the grape juice like you're one body and then when you get outside the worship service you have a common meal and you can't stand each other. You can't do it, in other words. He said you need to be one. Well, we've already pointed out the divisions. Some were caused by... Uh, personality problems perhaps, some spiritual immaturity, and some worldliness. But look at what Paul said here. Don't act one way during the worship service and another way uh, outside that worship service. Then back to 1 Corinthians chapter 4. Paul said in verse 4, I know nothing by myself, yet am I not hereby justified but he who judges me is the Lord. Therefore judge nothing before the time until the Lord come, who both will bring to light the hidden things of darkness and will make known the counsels of the hearts, and then shall every man have praise of God. And these things, brethren, I have in a figure transferred to myself and to Apollos for your sakes, that you might learn in us not to think of men above that which is written, that no one of you be puffed up one against another. It seems that there was a pride problem in the church at Corinth, that there were individuals who were puffed up, that they thought of themselves better than others or higher than others. And Paul here says, use us as an example for your sakes that men might learn in us not to think of men above that which is written. Now it could be the case that they were thinking themselves better than what was written or better than what was given to them in the Word of God. It may have been that they were thinking that they were uh, better than an individual. He says you're puffed up one against another. No matter which one it is, whether they were uh, considering themselves above the law, we've heard that phrase, right? Above the Word of God uh, or not amenable to the law of God or better than the law of God, that is they wouldn't have to adhere to it, or that they felt themselves better than another individual. Either one is bad and a hindrance. To success. Arrogance, pride, avarice, all of these things are uh, have no place in a successful church. In chapter 12 of 1 Corinthians, in chapter 12, Paul goes through a list of spiritual miraculous gifts that were limited to those individuals in the first century. The Bible tells us that miracles were for the purpose of confirming the Word of God, Mark 16, verse 20. 
In 1 Corinthians 13, the Bible tells us when that which is perfect is come, that's the Word of God, the perfect law of liberty, there was no more need for miracles. The Word of God had already been confirmed. We know it's the truth. We don't need miracles to prove it anymore. There's already been plenty of miracles to prove that the Word of God is the Word of God. But during the first century, these miracles took place. And some of them were for the purpose of worship. Some had a song. Some had a, a, a sermon. Uh, some had a prayer, right? Some prophesied, uh, some foretold, like I would be doing now, a, a foretelling a sermon, and some foretold, which would have been a miraculous event in the sense that they were telling some future event. But they were miraculous gifts, limited to the first century. And uh, obviously, uh, if we study the book of Acts, we understand that those miraculous gifts were given first to the apostles of Jesus Christ, and then those apostles were able to lay hands on Christians and pass on uh, the ability to perform those miracles. Therefore, when the apostles died, the ability to pass on those miracles died with them. But in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, there's a list of all kinds of miraculous spiritual gifts that were necessary in the first century. They were important in the first century. But there was a competition, if you will, <laughs> it seems, between brethren on which were the best gifts. Now, in verse 31, Paul said, of all the gifts, covet earnestly the best ones. And they didn't happen to be miraculous. <laughs> he says, and yet show I unto you a more excellent way. Verse 1 of chapter 13, Though I speak with tongues of men and of angels and have not love, I am become a sounding brass or a tinkling cymbal. In other words, Covet the things that can do the most good. You don't, have to have a, you don't have to have miracles to be able to do good. And that's what Paul was saying. In fact, the Word of God was uh, confirmed by miracles so that we wouldn't need them anymore. right? And one of the more important gifts was love. To love one another, to love God, to love self, to love His Word, to love His church so on and so forth. And then the rest of 1 Corinthians 13 describes what biblical love is. So here in the church at Corinth, it seemed like there might have been a lack of love. You all are, you all are more interested in the miraculous things which are only here for a period of time and they have a reason to be here, but they're going to go away and then what will you do? What are you going to do then when the miraculous has ceased? And Paul said, if you don't have love, you don't have anything. So maybe the church at Corinth was lacking in love. And if you lack in love, if you lack in love for God, you're not going to be the Bible student you ought to be. You're not going to be the faithful servant that God would want you to be. You're not going to be able to edify your brethren like you ought to. You're not going to be able to teach others like you ought to. You're not going to be able to grow and mature as you ought to. Without a proper love for God, you can't love anybody else, can you? You can't love anything. God is love. Then in 1 Corinthians chapter 14, <clears throat> this chapter goes along with this idea of the spiritual gifts, but it, we can make application to it to us today. Because uh, the, the miraculous have ceased, but worship has not. <laughs> the command to worship was an eternal one. An eternal command. It wasn't just given for a particular time. It was given for, a, for now on. And when it comes to worship, and for that matter, when it comes to living a Christian life, the way God would have us to live, God wants us to mimic Him. And the Bible tells us that God is a God of order. He's not a God of chaos or happenstance or accident. When these people, and I have to be, I have to bite my tongue, and that's, I'll just say people, say that the world and the universe happen by accident. You have to be some sort of ignorant, which means you just don't know any better, or are you just willfully stupid? You know the facts and you ignore them. To think that something like, the, like this world could just happen by accident. 
the world, the existence of the world, the fact that the, it rotates around the sun without burning up, the fact that the moon rotates around, uh, you know, the earth and the earth and the moon together in their orbits, and the other planets in their orbits, and none of them get out of whack. And they have it for thousands of years. Is proof of order. It's proof that God is a God of order. And, and of course, if we don't, if we can't see that for ourselves, God tells us in 1 Corinthians chapter 14, verse 33. He says, For God is not the author of confusion, but of peace, as in all churches and the saints. When you find peace, you'll find God, because people are doing things God's way. When you find confusion, God ain't there. God ain't there. If you have people who are doing things God's way, you're not going to have confusion. Verse 34, Let your women keep silence in the churches, for it is not permitted unto them to speak, but they are commanded to be under obedience, as also saith the law. Now, this is a reference to uh, in the worship service, in the worship assembly, each individual has a role. Men have a role, women have a role. In the worship assembly, uh, men were given uh, the leadership roles by God if for only the reason He just chose it that way. He told us in 1 Corinthians 15 He did because He made Adam first and Eve sinned first. But you know what? God don't have to explain to us why He did something some way. If God wants to do it that way, we ought to just say God wants it that way. That's good. And had God wanted women in the leadership role, and men to be in a subjective role. There are people be today fussing about that too. Everybody wants to fuss about something. And it's not about, it really has nothing to do with who's in leadership role and who's in a submission role. It's just about people just wanting to be fickle, really. <laughs> but anyway, we continue. Verse 35, if they will learn anything, let them ask their husbands at home, for it is a shame for women to speak in the church. And that's talking about in the public worship assembly. Then verse 40, this, is this, this sums up the whole reason for all of this. Let all things be done decently in order. That's God's reason for all of this. Somebody has to be in charge. When God designed the home, and He said let the man be uh, the head of the home, He could have chose the man or the woman. He chose the man. He had His reasons. He gives us some reasons. But somebody has to be head. When you have two people and uh, you're sitting there together discussing something, and it's a one-to-one -one vote, you either sit there and do nothing, or somebody has to break the tie, right? God knew that. But the whole point of all this is not, it really has nothing to do with roles. It has to do with decency and order. Now, was there a, decent, a decency and an order problem at Corinth? There may have been. But God wanted to make sure that there wasn't a decency and order problem and in order to make sure that everything was done decently and in order, that things worked like clockwork, that things were orderly, just like God is orderly. He said, here's how I want it done. And if we follow His pattern, it's going to be done right. When people change God's pattern, we have confusion. When people change God's pattern, we have chaos. When people change God's pattern, it's either because they don't care what God said or they don't love God. Or they don't know what God said and they don't care. <laughs> but if we know what God said and we love God, we're just going to follow His pattern. His pattern is going to work. It always has. So if there is an opposition to order, doing things decently in order, you're going to have an unsuccessful church. Sadly, I have seen some of this and it has caused much problems. Then in 1 Corinthians chapter 5, <clears throat> we read of two issues, really, that hinder the growth of the church. First, in verse 1, he says, it is reported commonly that there is fornication among you and such fornication as is not so much named among the Gentiles that one should have his father's wife. Sin in the camp is going to cause hindrances to success. Individuals have private sins that we have to take care of on a private basis. 
this was a public sin. Paul said it's reported commonly that there is fornication among you. Fornication is a sexual sin. Therefore, there was a disruption in the home, wasn't there? And if there's a disruption in the home, there's going to be a disruption in the church. Because churches are made up of families. <laughs> right? Families are made up of human beings. Churches are made up of those families. If there's chaos in the home, that's going to get, leak its way into the church. It did. It leaked its way into the church at Corinth. It caused problems at the church at Corinth. So the first we're going to deal with here is the, the sin, the public sin, the sexual sin, the disruption in the home. The fornication was a disruption in the home. So in 1 Corinthians 7, Paul defines marriage again to make sure everybody knows what it means to be married. Now before, we're not going to spend, we're not going to discuss the entire chapter uh, 7. But when you study chapter 7, Paul says some things that might be hard to understand. So read verse 26 first. It explains the whole chapter. Paul says, I suppose therefore that this is good for the present distress. Some of the things Paul said by means of inspirational advice, like maybe it would be good if you don't get married right now was because at the present distress, Christians were being persecuted and murdered. And uh, people were, wives were being taken from their husbands and saying, if you say you love Allah, for example, you can save your wife. You need to deny Christ and say Allah is God and your wife will be saved. But if you say Christ is the Son of God, your wife dies. So Paul said, because of persecution like that, it might be good to be single. That way you're not tempted when something like that happens. You just have to die yourself. Sometimes it's easier to take the bullet yourself than to watch your wife or your kids, right? How hard would it be to watch your wife and kids be taken from you and they say, you deny Christ, they live. Right? And, and we can't deny Christ, can we? We can't go to heaven if we deny Christ. So Paul said that the, during, the distri during this present distress, it might be good not to be married. But he says you, that's not a command because God wants people to be married. So when you study chapter 7, remember the present distress. He's talking about that in particularly. Uh, then, let's go back. I just wanted to mention that in particular because... That explains the rest of the chapter. But Paul does define marriage here because a disruption in the home is a hindrance to the church. So in, um, let's see, chapter 7, verse 2, he says, Nevertheless, to avoid fornication, let every man have his own wife, and let every woman have her own husband. Now this is very clear, isn't it? It's exactly the way God wanted it. How many husbands should a woman have? One. How many wives should a husband have? One. How many husbands should a husband have? None. How many wives should a wife have? None. Because you can't, that's not marriage. He Let every man have his own wife. Let every wife have her own husband. That's God's divine definition of marriage. Let the husband, verse 3, render unto the wife due benevolence, and likewise also the wife to the husband. The wife hath not power over her own body, but the husband. And likewise also the husband hath not power of his own body, but the wife. Obviously here talking about the sexual relationship between a man and a woman and that they are one, they shouldn't be defrauding one another. They shouldn't be fighting against, or using each other against each other. Verse 5, defraud you not one another except it be with consent, that is you decide to, for a time that you might give yourselves to fasting, prayer, and come together. Again, that Satan not tempt you for your incontinency. So here Paul says, here's the definition of marriage. We've got a disruption in the home, so we need to let everybody know a disruption in the home is a hindrance to the church. Let every man have his own wife and let every wife have her own husband. And there be no fornication, which would include adultery, cheating on your husband or your wife. So mayhem in the house or mayhem or disruption in the home is going to cause a disruption in the church. 
Now back to 1 Corinthians chapter 5, another problem that this fornication caused. The disruption in the home was as if that wasn't enough to cause a hindrance to the growth of the church. He says, verse 1, there's fornication among you. Verse 2, ye are puffed up and have not rather mourned that he's in public sin, that he that hath done this deed might be taken away from you, among you, for verily as absent in the body but present in spirit, have judged already as though I were there concerning him that hath so done this deed in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, when you are gathered together in my spirit with the power to our, of our Lord Jesus Christ to deliver such a one to Satan for the destruction of the flesh, that the spirit may be saved in the day of our Lord Jesus Christ. The second problem here was the church saw public sin and they did nothing about it. And Paul says here by inspiration of God, you have to do something about it. If this individual chooses to continue in this public sin, you have to withdraw fellowship from him until such time as he repents. In 2 Corinthians chapter 5, the Bible tells us that this man did repent. And Paul said, you bring him back and you love him like a brother because he did what was right. But at this point, they weren't doing anything to save his soul. Notice what, how Paul, uh, Paul says it. Deliver him to Satan now rather than in the end. In other words, make him feel pain in this life so that he'll repent. If he doesn't repent in this life, he's going to feel pain in the next life and that's going to be much worse. Don't let this man suffer in eternity because you let him. Go to this man and let him know he's in sin and he needs to get out of it so he can save his soul in the end. Allowing public sin to continue in a church is a hindrance to the church. Then in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, and I think this is where we'll, as you can see, we're just kind of, there's a lot of problems and issues in the church. It's sad in a way, isn't it? But isn't it great that at least we have all this information that we can learn from the past, that we might not do the same things, that we might not follow after the bad examples, that we can learn how to handle certain things? It could have been well that Paul was writing these letters to a congregation today. Right? In fact, he probably could write this to, a con to several congregations today. And the problem is they're not reading it. <coughs> we're going to read it because we want to go to heaven. And we're going to try to have a successful congregation by looking at the good and the bad. In 1 Corinthians chapter 15, and boy, there's a lot of good material in all these books, but... 1 Corinthians 15, wonderful, wonderful lessons. But we're going to start in verse 12 for, uh, for our purpose and time. Paul says, If Christ be preached that He rose from the dead, how say some among you that there is no resurrection of the dead? Now, the specific example here given is that there were individuals in the church who were denying the truth of the resurrection. Or there were those in the community who were denying the, the truth of the resurrection and that was causing individuals in the church to, to uh, doubt. So the example, the specific example at that time is the resurrection. But folks, this could be representative of any false doctrine. And so that's what we're going to call this. A hindrance to the success of a church is any deviation from God's Word. Anytime doctrine that opposes God's will or God's Word is introduced into the church, you're, going, you're not going to have any success. Now people might say, well boy, I drive by Church A and they've got thousands of cars in their pocket. Or I drive by Church B and they're building buildings and gymnasiums and cathedrals and I mean but see whose success what are you whose definition of success are we using there? That's the world's definition of success, isn't it? Like the rich man said, I'll just tear down old barns and build new. Right? And what did Jesus tell him? Today you're gonna to have to give an answer for your soul. You've got all this physical stuff, but what about your spiritual condition? How does God define success? God doesn't define success by how big your building is, how new the building is, how tall your steeple is. God defines success as 
Are they doing what I asked them to do? Are these people obeying me? And if they are, he says, they're my children. And it doesn't matter where they're meeting. It doesn't matter how many of them there are meeting there. That's God's definition of success. So anytime we have a deviation from doctrine, Anytime doctrine is introduced that opposes God's will or is in contradiction to God's will, like this was, you're not going to have success as God would define it. So, Paul, very logically, now there are people who say, well, we don't want to talk logic in the church. We just want to, you know, I just want to feel something in my heart. Well, Paul here uses logic. Lotus. If there be no resurrection, verse 13, of the dead, then Christ is not risen. Now we've got a big problem, don't we? <laughs> These people who say, well, there's not going to be a resurrection of the dead. Well, Paul said, if there's no resurrection of the dead, then Jesus ain't risen. And if Christ be not risen, verse 14, then we're preaching false doctrine. Verse 14. And your faith is vain. Why would their faith be vain? Because they obeyed the gospel that was preached by Paul. So if Paul's a false teacher, then they obeyed the doctrine of a false teacher. Verse 15, Yea, and we are found false witnesses of God because we have testified of God that He raised up Christ whom He didn't raise up if there's no resurrection. If so be that the dead rise not. For if the dead rise not, then is not Christ raised. So the only reason for the church's existence is that Jesus died on the cross shedding the blood that purchased the church, them raised from the dead to sit on the right hand of God as the king over that kingdom. And if He hasn't risen, then what good is it to be in the church? So any deviation from doctrine causes multiple problems, doesn't it? It causes these people to think. So we've looked at several things that hinder the success of a congregation as is given to us by the church at Corinth and the admonitions of Paul to that church. The problems with unity, divisions, spiritual immaturity, pride, arrogance, avarice, a lack of love for God, opposition to decency and in order, mayhem or disruption in the home, leading to disruption in the congregation, fellowship with sin, and deviation from truth. We've hit quite a few problems, haven't we, there in a short period of time. But our purpose is to learn from these problems that we not go through them ourselves. That we not repeat history but that we learn the lessons of history and that we be the church God would want us to be. To be added to the Lord's church, one must hear the gospel, believe it, repent of their past sins, confess that Jesus is the Christ, and be baptized, immersed in water to have their past sins washed away. Acts 2, verse 47, the Bible tells us God adds that individual to His church. And when Jesus comes again, He will take His church home. Ephesians 5, verse 27. We want to be in that church when Jesus comes because that's the church that's going home to heaven. Today, if you have not yet obeyed the gospel, the invitation is open. If you have obeyed those initial acts but have something in your life that separates you from God, take care of that now as we stand and sing. What a friend we have in